Today I'm gonna to build some European inspired cabinets for the shop, but I really wanna keep them in line with my other shop furniture designs. So let's see if we can make that happen on Timber Biscuit. So I've been doing a ton of shop upgrades the past two months, and now it's time to address some wall cabinet storage. I have a lot of space on the wall above my joiner, so I wanna to try to take advantage of that and maximize my efficiency in the shop. Now, because the cabinet is going to hang above my joiner, I had to get a little creative with the design. So my plan is to build two carcasses for the cabinet, one that's gonna be full size and the other that's gonna be about half the size that'll sit higher on the wall. And this again is so that it doesn't interfere with the bed of the joiner. Now, the other cool thing about this cabinet is it will live right behind my bench. So it'll make reaching things from the bench quite a bit easier than they are right now. So with all the goals for the project laid out, let's get into the build. And for this build, I'm gonna be once again using Baltic birch plywood. Well, mostly. My supplier ran out of Baltic birch plywood, which honestly is no surprise, so the doors for this cabinet will be made with some maple ply. We had a good run. So what I'm doing here is breaking down my sheet goods into more manageable sizes. Obviously working with full sheets of plywood is a little bit challenging in the shop, and using a track saw to break them down is a really efficient and easy way to get my cabinet parts down to size. So once I have my initial pieces cut out, I like to use them as a template to mark out my remaining parts. This way I know that everything's roughly the same size, and if there's any variances, I can quickly run them over the table saw to even them all up. Here I just try to err on the side of too large rather than too small, this way I have room to come back to that final dimension. And that's especially true when it comes to the sizing for the doors and back panel of the case. I just want to make sure that I have enough space to cut them down at the table saw later on, but I'm definitely not aiming for the perfect dimension right now. In fact, I'd venture to say that doing so is about as terrible as a joke about paper. Alright, so the sheet goods all broken down into more manageable sizes, I can now take them over to the table saw to cut them down to their final dimension. And I feel like it's important to say that the reason I don't cut them to their final dimension when I'm using the track saw is just because I don't think the track saw is as accurate as my table saw. I can really dial in the fittings using my fence, whereas with a track saw I can get like 95% there, but here we're aiming for 100. So another thing I find really helpful when cutting down large sheet goods like this is using a feather board. It helps keep those long pieces against the fence when you have to stand back far away from the saw. It makes keeping those cuts straight quite a bit easier. So once I have my really long pieces ripped down, I can swap out my table saw's fence for a crosscut sled and start crosscutting my shorter pieces. Now I gotta say that using the right size sled makes cutting these parts out a heck of a lot easier. I made my sled on the channel a couple years ago and I can't tell you how helpful it's been. Plus the dimensions of it allow me to cut down full size cabinets, so for this project that makes it super useful. So back over at the sled, what I'm going to do now is cut down my shelves. And I'm cutting my shelves down now just to get them to rough size. Since these cabinets will feature shelf pins, I'm cutting these down to the exact width that they need to be. Which in all likelihood means that these are going to be slightly too wide. But that's okay, I'd rather be slightly too wide here than slightly too narrow and have to recut them. Now I'm also using the crosscut sled to cut out my side panels and my doors. Now again here, I'm aiming for everything to be slightly oversized for the panels on the doors, but for the sides, we're trying to nail it. So when you're measuring things like the sides out for cabinets, just remember that 3 quarter inch plywood is actually more like 23 30 seconds. So you need to account for that when building the sides of your cabinet. If you don't, your center vertical partitions may be too short, so always double check your plywood size. Now since my cabinet's going to have two enclosed spaces, I needed four shelves for those areas, so I just set up a quick stop block to cut those out. Like I've said before, anytime you can create a stop to batch out work like this, don't hesitate to do so. Unlike the creator of Brella. You know, Umbrella. Alright, so next it was time to cut out that upper high cabinet. And because I've incorporated curves into my other shop furniture pieces, I decided to do so here too. So I just use a French curve template to add a subtle curve to my smaller high cabinet and transition it down to a shallower depth. Now while I'm showcasing this little feature, if you guys want plans for this project, let me know down in the comments. I'd be happy to put them together if there's enough interest. And if I do, I'll make sure to post an update to the community as well as update this video when they're available. Alright, so I decided to use my bandsaw to rip this line just because I feel like this cut is a lot easier at the bandsaw than it would be over at the table saw. And then from there I can just use a hold down clamp to hold the piece in place while I use a jigsaw to cut out the curves. Now this curve has to be cut two times, one time for the top and one time for the bottom. So next we'll need to match those curves up as closely as we can. But one thing that helps when cutting things out with the jigsaw is just to go slow and keep yourself just outside of your line. This way you can sand back to it, which is exactly how we're going to match these two up. Now to try to get those curves as even as possible and matching, I just use my random orbit sander to smooth out those plywood edges. Again here, as we covered in the past video, don't stay in any one place for too long, otherwise you risk rounding over those edges and we definitely don't want to do that. And then from there we can check our parts against our list and make sure we got everything we need. And since we do, we can do a jig. 
All right, so next we can mark out the rabbets for my side panels. Now I designed the cabinet with a back panel that rests in rabbets on the sides while running full length on the tops and bottoms. And that'll make more sense when we get there, but for now, what we need to do is cut out the rabbits. So to do that, I'm gonna set up a dado stack and a sacrificial fence over at the table saw. So once I have the sacrificial piece in place, I just set the blade height and width and cut in the rabbits. Now, my first three rabbit joints are pretty straightforward. All I'm gonna do is run those over the dado stack, butting them right up against the sacrificial fence, giving me my perfect width. And the only real pointer here I have is to use a push block to make sure that you have consistent pressure downward. Otherwise your rabbit will be uneven and have some waves in it and that's not ideal. And if you do, don't worry too much. You can always just use a router plane to clean up those rabbits later on. So a moment ago, I mentioned that the first three rabbits were pretty straightforward. This fourth rabbit is a little trickier and that it needs to be a stopped rabbit. So I make a mark on my sacrificial fence to let me know where my dado stack stops. Then from there, I just match that up with a mark on my board so that I can drop it down onto the dado stack, stopping before my mark. You can kind of compare this to using the dado stack and table saw as a router bit in this instance. And while I finish up that cut, if you're enjoying this video, give it a like. It allows this video to spread to more people and I really appreciate the support. Thanks. All right, so back over at the bench, I need to clean up that stopped rabbit. And to do that, I'm just gonna use a marking knife to first grab in a line. This will give something for my chisels to bite into. Then from there, I just use a chisel to clear out the bulk of the material. Now, since this is plywood, it's pretty easy to cut through the laminated layers. Here, I'm just careful not to go too far. Now, even though this joint's gonna be hidden for the most part, I think it's always best practice to take your time and go slow on this kind of thing. And once I get close to the bottom, I just use my router plane to even up the groove and make everything consistent. Just like my son when I tell him to go to bed. He's consistently late. And you'll have to excuse me, I love telling dad jokes. Sometimes he even laughs. All right, so with all that done, we can test the fit. And yeah, that looks good. All right, so next I marked out the orientation for all of my boards. And then from there, I could mark out the centers so that I had a reference point to line up my shelf pin jig. Now, again, I'm using shelf pins on these cabinets because I think in the shop, shelf pins make a lot of sense. But I've seen a lot of people make the argument that once they put shelf pins in, they never move the shelves. So let me know down in the comments if you like shelf pins or if you don't. If you're in the pro shelf pin camp, say yes, shelf pins. And if not, say no shelf pins. I'd really love to hear what you guys think. And while I try to reply to every comment, I'll make sure to reply to the comments that start with yes and no shelf pins first, because I know you guys are paying attention. All right, so once I have the shelf pin jig all set up, it's pretty easy and straightforward to plunge them in. All I do is align the marks on the jig with my center line and then plunge in the holes. And this jig also comes with these little plastic pieces to keep everything registered and in line. And if you'd like the link to the one I use here, I'll leave it down in the description. All right, so with all the shelf pins drilled, I can move on to the joinery for the cabinet. And I'm gonna use, you guessed it, pocket holes. Now, as I've said in the past couple of videos, I do not like pocket holes for furniture, but for shop furniture and cabinets, pocket holes are awesome. Now, if pocket holes aren't your thing, you could easily make a cabinet using dowels, dominoes, or biscuits. But again, I think pocket holes are really fast and efficient for a build like this. So that's why I went with pocket holes. So here I'm just using my jig to drill in two or three pocket holes into each board. Now I'm only putting pocket holes in the tops, bottoms, and vertical partitions. The rest of the cabinet structure is primarily gonna come from the rear panel. And again, if that sounds confusing, just hang with me. It'll all make sense when it comes time to assemble. Again, the only downside about using a pocket hole jig is that it gets sawdust everywhere. But as one commenter said on a previous video, sawdust is just man glitter, so I guess it's time to party. But really, where does all the glitter go? All right, so once I clean up the shop from all the festivities, I can start laying out the vertical partitions. And to do that, I'm just gonna use a combination of rules. What I like to do is lay out all my markings on one board first, and then align my boards and carry those marks onto the next board. This way, if I'm off one way or another by a small factor, it'll be the same on both boards, and I don't have to worry about fixing both sides. And then it's always a good idea to go back and use a piece of scrap to make sure that your measurements are close. Speaking of great ideas, if you haven't yet, Hit subscribe. I make new videos all the time about woodworking projects, tips, tricks, and furniture builds. So if you're enjoying this video, you'll probably like those too. So hit subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And as always, thank you guys for your support. All right, so now that I've dialed in the final heights for my cabinets, we can go ahead and cut down the back panels to their final dimension. Smooth. So again, the reason I waited to cut the panels down until now is because I didn't actually know what the back panel full height was going to be. And that's because of the variances that plywood brings to the table. Since I have all that dialed in now, it's easy enough to cut these down. Another option would be to wait until the actual outside of the cabinet was assembled and then take the measurement off that, but I'm fairly confident in my measurements, so I decided to go ahead and do these now. 
And I probably could have mentioned this earlier, but my back panels are going to be comprised of half inch plywood. And this is both to cut down the weight as well as give me more space inside the cabinet. If I'd gone with something like a quarter inch sheet, it wouldn't give me as much structure as a half inch sheet. So I think the half inch plywood is just a happy compromise. Plus we'll be using this rear panel to actually mount the cabinet to the walls. So we want that added strength and structure. So once I have the final length all marked out, I can just use the track saw again to cut these down. And this is just gonna go exactly like it did in the beginning, using a square to make sure that my marking was straight and then the track saw to make the cut. So with the rear panels all cut down, it was finally time to start assembly. And so I'll first start with the bottom of my larger cabinet. And this is definitely one of those times where labeling the parts really helps. Here I want to make sure that those pocket holes face the ground so they're not on the interior of the cabinet. The cabinet will sit low enough on the wall where these pocket holes won't actually be seen. Unfortunately, with the upper cabinet, they will be seen, but I think that's one of those things I just have to live with. So when assembling cabinets, it's really important to keep things as square as possible. And using these clamping squares makes it a heck of a lot easier. Because another issue I have when using pocket holes is that pieces want to slide around when driving in the screw. And using clamps like this locks pieces in place and doesn't allow them to move. So with the carcass of the cabinet complete, I could flip everything up and work on those vertical partitions. And again, I'm going to use those clamping squares to keep things square while I apply glue and drive in those screws. This is where marking out those partitions earlier really comes in handy because I can reference the outside of my boards to the line and then clamp everything in place, which makes assembling a case like this a little less stressful, but only a little. If you're running into issues with assembly like this, I recommend using a slower setting glue. This will both give you a little bit more working and open time and make things a little smoother. But luckily this case came together without any problems. All right, so next it was time to attach the rear panel. And first, I'm going to mark out where those vertical partitions exist on the back of my back panel, as well as a couple lines to know where the center of the tops and bottom boards are. From there, I'll just apply some glue and then drop on the back panel. And again, the top and bottom is going to be flush with the top and bottom shelves. From there, I add in a couple of brad nails into my sides before drilling a couple pilot holes and driving in some screws into those overlapping pieces. And I get asked quite a bit about this countersink bit, so I'll make sure to leave a link down in the description of this video. All right, so with screws driven in about every six inches, I can go ahead and flip up the case and check it for square. Now, honestly, there's not a whole lot I could do if this case wasn't square at this point, but it's good to know that everything came together the way it should. Next, I could repeat those same steps with the smaller upper cabinet. Only this time, I'm not going to attach the end piece. I'm going to keep these two cabinets separate and then attach them once they're actually hung on the wall. This way, I can cut down on the weight of trying to hang these two cabinets on the wall together, and it'll also make moving these cabinets to a different position in the future, if I want to, a heck of a lot easier. So once I had one side and one vertical partition attached, I could go ahead and attach the back panel again. And once again, I'm just going to drill in some pilot holes and drive in some screws. The cool thing about assembling the cabinets this way is that it leaves me a little overhang on the back panel, and that overhang fits perfectly into my rabbit on my other cabinet. So referencing these two pieces on the wall when it comes time to hang them, Ought to be pretty easy. And just like the ninth letter of the alphabet, I was done. So now that my two cases were assembled, I could finally cut out those doors. And to do that, I'm just going to measure out the front of my doors and then take the pieces over to the table saw and trim them down to their final width and height. Now, what I'm aiming for with my doors is about a sixteenth of an inch gap all the way around. This way I have a nice consistent reveal around my entire door face. But we can adjust that gap slightly using the hinges, and we'll talk about that more when we get there. For now, let's focus on the poles. Now, originally I had designed some European style poles that were going to inset into the door faces, but if you follow me over on Instagram, I shared a story about that and it just didn't work out for this project. So here I'm just gonna use my Forstner bit to cut in some circles to act as the poles. But I guess since they are the poles, they're not acting. This stays in line with the minimalist European look that I'm going for with these cabinets without adding a bunch of extra hardware to the cabinet faces. One trick I like to do when plunging all the way through with the force a bit like this is just adding a bit of painter's tape to the back side of my drill hole. This way, I minimize the tear out. Alright, so next it was time to attach the hinges. And for the hinges on this project, I'm going to be using Bloom soft close hinges. So I have this jig from Rockler that I got a couple years back that works great for these types of hinges. What it does is attaches to the door and gives you the exact placement and depth for your hinge cups. So it minimizes the thinking portion of setting these things up. Because once you set it up once, you don't have to think about it. Which, for me, is great. Like that old rotisserie oven ad, you know, set it and forget it. So once I struck my line three inches from the top and bottom, I could go ahead and just drill in the pockets. My only gripe with this jig is that it does jerk every now and then, but other than that, it's pretty good. From there, I could use a scrap board and some 16th of an inch shims to transfer my marks onto my carcass. 
From there, I use another jig to drill in my pilot holes for the hinge clips. All I have to do is line up my lines, then use a self-centering drill bit to drive in the pilot holes. Again, this is no-brainer stuff, which at this point in the project is my kind of woodworking. All that's to say that you don't really need these jigs to attach these hinges. Bloom has some pretty comprehensive instructions, but they are in metric, so my American audience may have to do some converting. I know, I know, or just work in metric. All right, so next I can attach the hinge to the door. Now I just use my double square to line everything up, then a self-centering bit to drill in my pilot holes and drive in the screws. Now, because my upper cabinet has really wide doors, I went ahead and installed those hinges at like 85 degrees. This way, they would lift the outside of the door up a little bit to relieve some of that weight. And as you can see here, after a few adjustments, the doors work flawlessly. Uh, wait, that's too far. So to fix that, I'm just gonna cut a couple of strips out over at the table saw. And for this one, I'll just use my smaller crosscut sled. So once I have the strips cut out, I can bring them over to the bench and use a scrap piece to set the depth on the stop. And then from there, a little glue and brad nails hold the stop in place. Now, another way to stop the door is just to use the shelves as a stop. But in this case, I cut my shelves a little narrower than the cabinet width, so the stop works great. All right, so next I could prep the doors for paint. And all I'm gonna do is sand everything up to about 180 grit. Now, since I only have four doors to paint, I'm not gonna bust out the sprayer to do these. I'm just gonna roll them out with a nice rolling nap. So my first application is gonna be two coats of Kills Primer. I've used this stuff on plenty of projects and it works great as a primer, but it does give off quite a bit of fumes, so make sure you have good ventilation if you're using it. Once I have the first coat on, I'll wait about an hour and a half and then apply the second coat. Once I gave that about eight hours to cure, I could go ahead and apply my first coat of paint. And for that, I'm just gonna use this nice cool gray because I think it matches pretty well in the shop and overall, it's pretty neutral. And for this one, I'll look real serious, giving it three coats, waiting about an hour between coats. Lighten up, Shane. You're supposed to be having fun. So while we're on the topic of fun things, if you're enjoying these videos and you want to support the show, I'd like to invite you to join my Patreon, where you'll get discount codes on plans and merch, an invite to the Discord server, some free stuff, and access to monthly live chats. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, be sure to check out the link below. And again, to all those who've already joined, thank you guys so much for your continued support. It means the world. All right, so getting back to it, I drafted my wife to help me hang these cabinets up. Now what I did first was install a brace at the bottom of the cabinets so I could keep everything level and straight when I installed them. From there, I just used a couple screws, making sure to drive them into studs, and yeah, the cabinet was hung. For the smaller upper cabinet, I basically followed the same process, only this time I drove in my pocket hole screws to make sure that everything stayed aligned and then drove the screws into the wall. And before you ask, yes, that's my step ladder. My real ladder wasn't available. I promise that's the last dad joke of the episode. From there, it was on to the finish. Now, for the finish on this piece, I'm just going to be using penetrating oil, and I'm only using it on the exterior surfaces. I'm not going to finish the interior of the cabinet. And that's just because it's a shop furniture, and that's a lot of surface area. But I do love how the penetrating oil makes those laminated layers pop out, so I did apply this to the clamp rack I built in the last episode. From there, I could pop in the shelf pins, and then slide in the shelves. Now these shelf pins are five millimeters, so make sure that you check with your jig and whatever bit you're using for your jig to make sure that you have the correct size shelf pins. From there, popping in the shelves is pretty straightforward. You just slide them on. And again, because they're adjustable, if I want to, I can move them around. All that was left was to hang the doors using the hinges. And before I forget, if you need to make any adjustments to the hinges, there's three screws on the hinges that will adjust up, down, in, or out, so you have some options to adjust the fitting on the doors. From there, all that was left was to fill her up and see how it turned out. So yeah, designer quality cabinets in the wood shop, why not? I think this goes back to my statement on the Rubo, that if you make the environment you work in reflect the type of work you wanna make, it's a win-win. So while these cabinets may not be for everyone, maybe you're a more shaker style cabinet individual, I think these cabinets are pretty stellar. The curved upper cabinets really fit in with the other shop furniture I've built recently, and it leaves me plenty of room to utilize my joiner without bumping into it. So I hope these give you some ideas for some space saving solutions in your shop. And hey, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, check out this video next. Subscribe so you don't miss the next project, and I'll see you next time.